morning. Good morning. Welcome to the International Gathering at Beth Rafa, where the Bishop Jacqueline E. McCullough is our senior pastor and general overseer. We do welcome all of you on all social media platforms this morning on this, the Lord's day. We're going to begin with the men covering us in a word of prayer. Good morning, good morning. We are asking all the men, stretch, please stretch your hands forth as a posture of covering. Let's be. Father, we thank you this morning for your goodness and your mercy. Please forgive us our sins, we pray. Lord, I pray this morning that, Lord, you will cover. Let your anointing, let your glory cover, oh God your people, send your word to our hearts, speak to your servant and allow, let her declare your word to the hearts of your people. We thank you now, we come against every glitches, every assignment of the enemy that will hinder the word and the hearts of your people will be prepared to receive your word and we thank you now in Jesus name. Amen and thank the Lord. Amen, amen. We do welcome all of you again. And those of you in the Zoom room this morning, they got up for the early morning sacrifice. And those of you who on any social media platform preparing to go to your churches, or maybe you, you worship with us on Sunday, we do welcome you this morning. And let's get excited about another day that the Lord has made. And he tells us to rejoice and be glad in it. And let me just say this to you this morning as we go forth in our hymns, uh, our morning hymn, I should say, but first Sunday hymns. And we are just excited about the fact that the Lord died for us and rose again. Because of that, we have hope. Always remember your hope is in the Lord this morning. Check your devices in the Zoom room. Make sure that your devices are muted. And let's just be, uh, go forth in our worship this morning. My hope is
Let us pray. O God, whose blessed son did manifest himself to his disciples in the breaking of bread. Open, we pray thee, the eyes of our faith, that we may behold him in all his redeeming work. Through the same thy son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, amen. I will be reading in your hearing the Old Testament scripture for instruction, Psalm chapter 33, verses 1 through 11. That's Psalm chapter 33, verses 1 through 11. Please open your Bibles and turn to Psalm 33, verses 1 through 11. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. Rejoice in the Lord, O ye righteous, for praise is comely for the upright. Praise the Lord with harp. Sing unto him with the psaltery and with an instrument of ten strings. Sing unto him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his works are done in truth. He loveth righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as an heap. He layeth up the death in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord bringeth the counsel of the heathen to naught. He maketh the devices of the people of none effect. The counsel of the Lord standeth forever the thoughts of his heart to all generations. So far, the scriptures. Our New Testament scripture for admonition will come from Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. That's Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. We will read it responsibly while you remain on mute. I will read the first verse, and while on mute, you will read the next verse. And we will continue until verse 12, when we will read together. Again, that's Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 12. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest. And desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that it found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand, and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did he eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth together, and have seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. So far, the scriptures. As you remain muted, let us confess together the declaration of our faith, the Apostles' Creed. It will appear on the screen. Let us begin. I believe in God, the Father, Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. When we say one Catholic and apostolic church, we are not only referring to the Roman Catholic Church, but to the, the church universal. And by one baptism for the remission of sins, we mean the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when we say he descended into hell, we mean he went into the grave. For more information on the creeds, please refer to our website, betrafa.org, why we do the things we do. Amen. We are celebrating and getting excited about the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that his blood was shed for you and for me? The scripture says, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance. And we want to remember today, amen? The cleansing wave.
Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, God, we just thank you for the blood. We thank you, God, how you have covered us down through the years, God. It was only because of the precious blood of the Lamb. Glory be to the living God. And so, God, today we lift up our bishop, Bishop Jacqueline McCullough. God, we thank you for this servant leader that you've given her. We thank you because she, you've given her uh, you've given us a pastor after your own heart to feed us with knowledge and understanding. And so we are well-fed people. Glory be to God. And so, God, we plead the blood of Jesus around her, around her home, around her family. We pray, oh, God, that you'll continue to preserve her. We thank you how you've kept her, God, even during this pandemic. She, she's stronger now than she, she was before, God, and only you could have done it. Only you could have preserved life. Only you could have, have kept her, God, from all hurt, harm, and danger. And we do thank you. And then, God, we lift up President Biden. Glory be to God. Not only, God, do we thank you for him, but we thank you, oh God, that he has, uh, that you placed him in, in the position that he's in to do your bidding and to do your will. And so we pray that he will hear your voice and he will respond to godly counsel. Then we lift up the cabinet. We lift up Vice President Kamala Harris. And God, we're praying for her. We, we uh, curse that uh, COVID virus at the root, God. And we pray, God, for herself and her family. God, that you'll heal her and there'll be no residual effects. Then we lift up Beth Rafa's leadership. God, you brought us all to this place for such a time as this. And so, God, we thank you that we will be in place you said that you said in the body as it pleases you. And so God help us to accept where you have placed us and to flourish where you have placed us. And then God, we're calling for all the new converts. God, you th we thank you because they're coming hungry. Glory be to God. Some are weary, some are worn down from the battles in the world, God, but they're coming to you for rest. And God, we thank you that the, the gospel is being preached and they're going to be raised up in the things of God to be strong disciples. And so, God, we love you. Then we're calling in the souls from the north, south, east, and west. Glory be to God. God, they are coming. Hallelujah, God. They are coming to see you, not to hear us. They're coming to see and to get a word from you. And so, God, we thank you for every soul that will come. And then, God, we lift up those in the congregation that are in need of healing. We're lifting up Junie Harris and Lisa Rodriguez. We're lifting up Brother Fillmore, Mother James, and all, all the others that are being challenged in their bodies. But you said healing is the children's bread. Glory be to God. And so, God, we know that Jesus bore every sickness, every disease known and unknown to man was taken to the cross with him. And so we pray, God, that that appropriate strike would be laid on our people, God, and that they would be healed from the top of their heads to the soles of their feet. And then, God, we're lifting up all those that need to be comforted. God, your word says, precious is the death of the saints in the sight of the Lord. But on this side, God, he still has loved ones that, that miss them. And God, we ask that you would comfort them, that you would keep them, and you have kept them. Glory be to God. You have comforted them even in the night season. When all of the um, the calls stop and then the cards stop, and but you're there with them, you said you wouldn't leave them and you wouldn't forsake them. And then God, we're lifting up uh, the property. We're praying, oh God, for a financial breakthrough for uh, Beth Rafa. And uh, I remember uh, Junior Deacon Sam Edy last week, he prayed for generational wealth. Glory be to God. And so, God, we thank you that you have prepared our hearts to be able to receive uh, this, this income so that we can use it for the gospel's sake. And so, God, we're, we're asking that you would uh, release and sever any prior claims on the property that you designated for Beth Rafa, because we will use this property to the glory of God. You said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. And so, God, we thank you for the drawing. We thank you for the people that will come. We thank you for all the souls that will be saved. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And thank God.
Welcome to Beth Rafa. There's so many things that come our way to crush us and almost destroy us. Yes, we can become overwhelmed, disheartened, discouraged, and disappointed. While these feelings are common to all human beings and are designed to keep us down and depressed, we can take all these feelings to the Lord because he's the only one that can lift our hearts, heal our souls, and strengthen our minds. He is truly a heart fixer and a mind regulator. Let us turn to him in our time of despair. On behalf of our senior pastor, Bishop Jacqueline E. McCullough, welcome to Beth Rafa, where you can experience healing to heal by loving Christ. Bienvenido a Beth Rafa. Hay tantas cosas que se cruzan en nuestro camino para aplastarnos y casi destruirnos. Sí, podemos sentirnos abrumados, desanimados y desilusionados. Estos sentimientos son comunes para todos los seres humanos y están diseñados para mantenernos deprimidos. Podemos llevar todos estos sentimientos al Señor porque Él es el único que puede animar nuestro corazón, sanar nuestra alma y fortalecer nuestra mente. Él es verdaderamente el reparador del corazón y regulador de la mente. Volvamos a Él en nuestro tiempo de desesperación. De parte de nuestra pastora y obispo Jacqueline McCullough, bienvenido a Beth Rafa, donde usted puede experimentar sanidad para sanar por amor a Cristo. Bienvenue à Beth Rafa. Il y a tellement de choses qui se présentent à nous pour nous écraser et presque nous détruire. Oui, nous pouvons être submergés, déprimés, découragés et déçus. Eh bien, ces sentiments sont communs à tous les êtres humains et sont conçus pour nous maintenir abattus et déprimés. Nous pouvons apporter tous ces sentiments au Seigneur parce qu'il est le seul qui peut élever nos cœurs, guérir nos âmes et fortifier nos esprits. Il est vraiment un fixateur du cœur et un régulateur de l'esprit. Tournons-nous vers lui en notre temps de désespoir. Au nom de notre pasteur titulaire, l'évêque Jacqueline Eumacola, bienvenue à Bedrafa, où vous pouvez expérimenter la guérison pour guérir en aimant le Christ. Beth Rafa family and friends, our Mother's Day virtual celebration is fast approaching. Please mark your calendars this Saturday, May 7th from 11 a.m. to 1.30 p.m. This year's theme will be a restored woman, taken from St. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. Our keynote speaker this year will be Her Grace, Bishop Jacqueline E. McCullough. This fundraiser is for the benefit of the Destiny Academy in Monrovia, Liberia. The event promises to be an afternoon of celebration as we honor the women in our lives who have demonstrated a life of redemption and restoration through the power of God. To purchase tickets, go to our website, BethRafa.org, and click on the Mother's Day banner that says, A Restored Woman, and then click on Get Tickets. 
Remember, invite a woman or man whose life has been a testament of God's grace and his restoration. We greet you in the precious name of Jesus. We are at such a remarkable and pivotal time in both world history and the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. We would like to encourage our Beth Rapha members, the Rapha Alliance and their congregations and our supporters on all social media platforms to seize this opportunity to be a part of our 20th anniversary souvenir journal. In the journal, you may advertise your heart sentiments for those elevated in ministry at our first ever virtual Holy Convocation in November, 2021. Or you may share well wishes or how your lives have been impacted by our commitment to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ, led by our Bishop Her Grace, Jacqueline E. McCullough and our leadership team. We assure you that every seed you sow into this ministry is invested in the kingdom of God. Won't you partner with us today in support of our anniversary journal that will showcase the life of our ministry from inception until this very day? Indeed, God has positioned us to be a restored generation taken from our theme for this year, Joel chapter 2, verses 25 to 27. You may submit your ads or inquiries to our email at journal at bethrafa.org. That is journal at bethrafa.org. Or you may visit our website, www.bethrafa.org. Thank you for your continued support of the International Gathering at Beth Rafa. Thank you for trusting us. See you in the journal. The deadline is fast approaching. May the Lord bless you richly. Thank you. The spring quarter for BRCC began on Monday, April 18th, and registration ends today, May 1st. We have a host of classes available to you for your continued pursuit in biblical studies. In addition, this quarter, we will be offering several new classes to include Biblical Hebrew 3, taught by Professor Andre Mira, Hymnology in the Church, taught by Professor Anne-Marie Hudley, and a course entitled Jesus Talks to Buddha, taught by our own Dr. Brian McKenzie Sr. If you're interested in taking courses this spring, please visit our website, BethRafaSeminary.org, or contact Dr. Pat Bean, Director of Admissions, and or Missionary Jewel Jackson, Registrar. A master schedule of all classes is available upon request. Thanks so much. We look forward to seeing you in classes. Dr. Trish McLeod. Beth Rafa family and friends, it's time once again for our souls to be watered and refreshed during our annual spring revival. It will commence on Sunday, May 15th through Friday, May 20th. The theme is restoration and refilling. Taken from John chapter seven, verses 37 through 39. Prayer will begin at 7 p.m. and service at 8 p.m. We will use the fellowship link. The speakers are as follows. On Sunday, May 15th, during our 6.30 p.m. service, Pastor Brian McKenzie Sr. On Monday, May 16th, Reverend Amy Gardner. On Tuesday, May 17th, Reverend Doreen Bingham. On Wednesday, May 18th, Reverend Anthony Jackson. On Thursday, May 19th, Reverend Suzette Parchment, and on Friday, May 20th, Pastor Trish McLeod. And we welcome you to our Barnabas Ministry Discipleship classes live on Zoom every Wednesday from 7 to 7.45 p.m. We are studying the doctrine of Christ. If you would like to connect with us, just go to our website, BethRafa.org. Click on the Ministries tab, then on Barnabas. Scroll down and click on Barnabas Ministry Zoom Sessions. If you would like to view a previous class, visit our YouTube page and type in Barnabas Class. And check out our Barnabas Ministry group on Facebook. Questions? Email us, barnabas at bethrafa.org. We would love to hear from you. These have been your announcements. Any additional announcements will come from our bishop. And put your hands together. It's offering time in the sanctuary. Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone, and welcome to 
yet another Lord's Day. It is my privilege and my honor to present to you our tithing exhortation for this morning. I give honor to our bishop. I give honor to those leaders that are here. I also welcome all those that are streaming and those that are in the Zoom. Welcome to another opportunity to worship in giving, to further the gospel through our giving. This practice of tithing is just a regular reminder of our dependence on God. So today I'm going to be exploring in this month, we'll be exploring 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. That's 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. Here begins God's holy word. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. So far, the text. Now this letter, Paul is writing this letter to Timothy and in 1 Timothy 3, 15, he's summing up why he's writing. And uh, it says in the New King, James Version, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of truth. He's writing to Timothy so that he will be clear. He sent Timothy to Ephesus and Ephesus was one of the wealthiest cities in the ancient world. No doubt there were a lot of rich converts there. And so Paul is giving instruction to Timothy how the people that he will be ministering to can be faithful servants. How's your servanthood this morning? How are you managing your finances? We're living in a time when there's a lot of uncertainty when it comes to the world, inflation. Um, there's a whole lot of talk about uh, the, the, um, the finances even of the country. You know, the war is, is causing a lot of things and even the COVID has caused a lot of uh, uncertainty. But today we have an advantage my subject for this morning, there's an advantage of having a contented mind. Now we have to understand, as it says here in 1 Timothy 6 and 6 through 8, we brought nothing into this world. We have to understand who really holds all that we possess. We need to refocus our thinking because when we're in this world, we're taught if you're wealthy, you have it going on. But that's an arrogant way to think because with the uncertainties in the economy, I'm sure that during the COVID, you were able to notice, even if you had money, you couldn't find things. You had to wait online. Money did not guarantee anything. But we have a certainty that when we give into the kingdom, the Lord is going to see us through. David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. We have to, in this time of uncertainty, know that we are serving a God that no matter what goes on in the economy, that he is going to see us through. We have to refocus because sometimes we're taught we have to get riches. We have to get two or three jobs. We have to do all these things. But the wealthy, they tend to think higher of themselves and they almost look down on others that do not have. In 1 Samuel 2, verses seven through eight, and I'm just gonna give you a little bit of synopsis of it. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low 
and lifted up. He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifted up the beggar. We're not without hope this morning. Second Corinthians nine and seven says, for God loves a cheerful giver. So when we're giving, we're giving cheerfully, knowing that we're advancing the kingdom. We cannot be thrown off by the uncertainties and love of money, as it says in this text. People are eager, eager for money, but it's going to come to naught. So we have to pursue after righteousness and godliness. The rewards of our giving are not co just confined to this world, but they're going to go on into eternity. Luke 12, 33 and 34 says, a treasure in the heaven that faileth not, where no thief approacheth. We have to remember in Matthew 6, 31, it says, take no thought what you shall eat or what you shall drink because your heavenly father, he knows what you need. So even with money, he knows what we need. All we have to do is be faithful stewards. Just explore with me this uh, month, how I'm going to unravel how we can be good and faithful stewards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reverend Doreen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We put our hands together and thank you so much for reminding us what, what, what really matters. Now, you know, um, money is a very sensitive thing. When, when you talk about money, it, 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 it raises a lot of emotions because money is so intricately connected to our heart. It's intricately connected to our needs. It is intricately connected to our image, our desires, our ambitions. So when you touch money, you touch the center of people's hearts. That's why the Bible said the love of it is the root of all evil. So to, on a Sunday morning like this on the Lord's Day, to remind you that you're not rich because you have a lot of things or you have access to a lot of money can be very um, disconcerting because we see that as the answer to our life, to our heart's desire, to our destiny, so to speak. So when that's touched like that, we can get turned off because we feel like if I had it, I would be. If I had it, I would go. If I had it, I would become. And Jesus said, you have me. See, that's the problem right there. And we're not satisfied with him because we don't think that having him is enough. So you're going to you're going to take have to take this exhortation and put it in perspective. Yes, David said, I was young and now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. But there are times when we do fall into financial situations whether we do bring it to ourselves or because of circumstances. But what David was saying, in the midst of it, God will deliver, God will instruct, God will direct if we are righteous. And what does righteous mean? If we put him in the center of our lives and see him as our true riches. That's something to think about. Don't get sensitive and irritable because people are not giving you any quick, rich schemes or telling you how you can prosper and become. And many Christians, are, they are determined that they're going to find a way. They're going to find a way to live a certain way. Don't reduce, don't, don't even touch that. But this morning, your heart is the thing that God is after, not the money the richness of relationship with him for the Christian. Keep that in mind. Keep that exhortation in mind as you give unto the Lord this morning. God bless you. The blood prevails, the blood prevails. Just as in olden days, no matter what the people say, the blood prevails, the blood prevails. I know the blood prevails, the blood, the blood prevails, the blood prevails. Just as in olden days, no matter what the people say, the blood prevails, the blood prevails. I know the blood prevails. Yeah.
I know the blood prevails. Amen. And somebody might say, well, what does that mean? You know, I know the blood prevails. Does it mean that we have blood to sprinkle? Does it mean that we have to bring back, bring to our worship experience an animal? Does it mean that we have to crack a chicken neck and sprinkle it in our homes? No. It means that we have to thank God that Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood once and for all to atone, amen, to cancel our sin, which means that we were born sinners. We were born enemies of God. We were born living offensively to God's holiness. But because Jesus died on the cross, shed his blood, and we believe it, and we receive the fact that his blood is powerful enough, we use the word efficacious, but it means it's powerful enough to cancel our sin in the eyes of God. And when he looks at us, he sees us as his children, and he reaches out and pulls us towards him because we are no more an offense to him. And it still prevails today because people are still believing that. Every day somebody believes it and every day someone gets pulled into God. So you, we celebrate it, we raise our hands and we celebrate that we believe in the finished work of Calvary. We believe that Jesus' blood canceled our sin our faith in that act on Calvary, his resurrection and the fact that he lives forever, all of that caused us to believe that he is the answer to our sin question. That's why we say the blood prevails. So come on and wave your hands this morning. If you believe that as a Christian, this is not mysticism, this is not superstition, This is what the Christian believes based on what Jesus did over 2,000 years ago and what is declared in the Bible. That's where we get our faith and we stand on it. Hallelujah. 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 We stand on it. We don't waver. We stand on it. Hard times, we stand on it. Can't see our way, we stand on it. Feel defeated, we stand on it make mistakes, but we stand on it. So we thank God that the blood prevails. Amen. Welcome to the International Gathering at Beth Rapha. And we thank God that this is the day that the Lord has made, and we are rejoicing, and we're glad in it. We're so glad that you joined us. And guess what? We don't feel like we're the only ones. We are part of a great gathering Hundreds and hundreds of people believe the same thing that we believe. Maybe we have little differences in certain areas, but the bottom line, we believe Jesus is Lord and we worship him as Lord and Savior. Whether we speak one language or another, whether we are from one culture or another, the bottom line is there are other people believing. Maybe not at the same hour of the day, maybe not at the same place, but we are part of a great gathering. Hallelujah to Jesus. Great gathering of people who believe the same thing. So we don't feel isolated. We don't feel superior. We don't feel like we're the only one. We are so glad that the body of Christ passes or or, or cuts cross culture, cuts cross geography. Amen. And we are able to lift our hands and say, Thank God for Jesus this morning. And we say hallelujah, hallelujah, 
Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. My God. Amen. We have brothers and sisters that we have not met yet. Amen. We have brothers and sisters that are living in different places, but they love the Lord and they serve him. And so we are rejoicing in the God of our salvation. Amen. And the Christian church moves on. Praise the Lord. Amen. 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 I greet all of the leaders and all of the members of the church, whether you're in Beth Rafa or in another church, whether you're in the Zoom gathering or you're out there on social media. And no matter what, who owns social media, what's going on in social media, we still have an opportunity to connect. Amen. And we celebrate that. And prayerfully, we hope that nothing will interfere with that. But we want you to always remember, whether you can get on or not, we are still praying for you. And we are so glad that you're part of Christ's church. This morning, it's my privilege to bring you the word. But before we do that, we're going to have a sermonic solo by Deacon Byron Sims. <laughs> Amen. grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like Praise you, God. Praise 
Praise God, praise God, amen. It was grace that brought us safe thus far and grace will lead us home. Thank you, Deacon Byron. This is such an appropriate song for the Lord's day. Amen, the first Sunday in May. Can you believe it? We're almost half of the year already and the grace of God has brought us safe thus far. Amen. I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles, if you have your Bibles with you, to the book of Philippians chapter 3, and I'm going to be reading verses, uh, let's see, Philippians chapter 3, verse 8, just one verse. Or well, let's start at verse 7, verse 7 and 8. Verse 7 and 8, Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 7 and ending at verse 8. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. I'm reading from the King James Version. You may be reading from the, the NLT. You may be reading from the ESV. But I believe we're going to be saying and seeing the same thing. Here begins God's word. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So far, the reading and hearing of God's word. And the title of this message is, I Learned How to Count. I learned how to count. Now, if you've had any a relationship with children in their early stages of development, one of the things that you probably engaged in was counting, the ABC and the counting. You start off with one to 10. You know, when my experience is that we use the stairs. As they came up the stairs, one, two, three, and sometimes three was five, but you know, we worked it out and we were able to get to 10. And next thing you know, they went to 20. And next thing you know, they're telling me how to count, okay? And the, the counting is to teach them how to determine value, how to determine what something is worth. And so they left the basic of counting or, and then they went to addition, then they went to subtraction, then they went to multiplication, and then they went to things like ge um, uh, geometry and trigonometry, and then they really move on to calculus and all of that. So, so counting opens the door for a whole lot of things. Once you start with counting, what you're after, you're after determining the value. You're after measuring. You're after evaluating. You're after determining the worth. And that's what Paul did with his life. How do you determine the worth in your life this morning? Many of us determine the worth in our lives by what we have accomplished. Many of us determine the worth in our lives by if we're in demand or if we're known, if we're, if we're well known, if we're renowned. Many of us determine the worth in our lives if a lot of people like us or we get a lot of respect. We have many ways of determining the worth, whether it comes from our family tradition or it comes from societal way of saying, this is what you're worth. Elon Musk in, in our eyes is worth so much because of his money and the things that he's doing and the influence and the power that he has, so-called has in society. Unfortunately, the church has taken on that way of counting, estimating and determining their worth. And so we have in the book of Philippians, and Philippians, of course, is a letter written to the church at Philippi, and Philippi is 
in Macedonia, a Roman colony. They usually call it Little Rome. You know, sometimes you go to a city and because of where, well, who is concentrated in that area, they may call it Little Italy, or they may call it, you know, Chinatown because of how it, 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 it um, takes on the image of a certain culture. Well, well, the church at Philippi or the Philippians or the people who live in Philippi took on the culture of Rome. And so this is where um, um, Paul went and preached the gospel. But his first experience there was not very pleasant. He ended up in prison, but it was successful because whatever happened in prison, the earthquake came, he was released, and even the Philippian jailer got saved. So a church was established in Philippi by Paul, even though he had a lot of difficulties in that place. Now he's in a, a house prison in Rome, but he's still writing to the church in Philippi. And it's called a prison epistle, just like the other epistles like Ephesians and, and, and Philemon. He wrote there because Paul had such a strong connection. He, and, and the letter he wrote is a letter of affection. You know, he's saying, you're doing so well, you're growing. Philippian, you know, the Philippian church was not a church that gave Paul a lot of problems. It was a church that took the gospel, lived the gospel, and most importantly, they were very, very affectionate towards Paul. They didn't just see him as someone preaching, but they saw him more like a father, caring and giving them the opportunity or pointing them to the way of Christ. And they were so grateful for that, that they cared for him personally. So he had a very, very personal and affectionate relationship with this church. There were, you know, it's not a perfect church because there were some disturbances, but he was able to bring correction. And so when you open the, this third chapter, you will see Paul rejoicing and saying, I rejoice in the Lord. And, 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 and he exhorts them to rejoice. And then he will also tell them, be careful of false teachers, people that are coming in to teach you doctrines away from Christ. That's what it's, exactly it means. And then he shows them that they are the true church. They may not have had physical circumcision because the church was made up of Jews and of Gentiles, of rich people, of poor people, of soldiers. So it was a mixed multitude. So some of them were not physically circumcised, but he's saying the most important thing is to have your heart circumcised, peeled away, stuff peeled away so that the grace of God can be applied. And then he talks to them about uh, um, um, having, not trusting in the flesh, but trusting in the Lord. And then he went on to talk about where we're going to park for a little bit, what it means to, to lose or to, to regard certain things as a loss. He counted and he counted it a loss. Okay, so the first point after that little background, I want to take you to the church at Philippi. I want you to walk up in there this morning. I want you to walk up in Paul's spirit and see what he's telling that church, because whatever he's saying to that church, he's saying to us. So listen to him very carefully. And the first thing I want to talk about is um, the, 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 the point is I cut my losses. Now, I know that word has been used in, in accounting you know, or in relationship. It means cutting the losses means you stop doing what you're doing in order to prevent a bad situation from getting worse. That's according to the Collins Dictionary. In other words, let me cut my, my, my losses now before this gets completely out of control. And I really, really experience a greater loss. I cut the losses now so I won't have a greater loss. It's not going in the right direction. So let me stop it like a bad relationship. Let me stop it now before it gets out of control. That's exactly what Paul was saying, okay? So in order to cut one's losses, someone, you must have gained something. If I wanna cut my loss, it means that I had gained something so I could cut it. You're not cutting losses if you're already, if you're already lost or you already lost something. Are you already, you know, um, um, defeated? 
So you're not going, you're not going to cut, but you must have something to lose. You know, when, when Christians sometimes testify, they, some of them say back in the day I had, you know, in other words, back in the day they were doing better. They didn't cut their losses. Okay. Paul did. And this is what he said, starting from verse seven of Philippians three, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. So he had gained some things that he's cutting a loose. Okay. So what are some of the things that he's gained? And I'm just going to touch on a few of them. The advantage of his birth. Paul, in his mind, came from a good stock. You know, when we, we, we when where I was raised in Jamaica, people often talk about what family you came from, and I'm sure they do it in other places too. But it was very strong where you came from, where you live, what kind of family you came from, and they'll tell you that family is no good. There's not a good stock. Don't hang out with those children. Well, Paul felt like he came from a good stock. He was born in Tarsus, the chief city of Cilicia. He was a citizen. He was also a Roman citizen. So he had dual citizenship because his, his father probably was a Roman citizen also. His name, his name had a Roman name. He, he was, even though he was part of a Roman citizenship, but his name came from his Jewish connection. You see, he came from the tribe of Benjamin. And if you remember, the first king of Israel was Saul. And Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin. So originally his name was Saul, but when he con got converted, it was changed to Paul. So you're talking about someone who is who was proud of his heritage, came from a good stock, came from the chief city. My family's name can even be traced to the first king of Israel. So that's the first thing. The second thing was his Jewish heritage. He believed that he was somebody because of who he was in terms of his culture. All right? And he was not scattered. His family was not scattered like a lot of the Jews, you know, with the Gentiles. They didn't mix with the Gentiles. They stayed within their Jewish culture, within their Jewish teaching, and within the Jewish religion. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrew, meaning he was steep in the Hebrew culture. He was steep in the Hebrew religion, and he felt proud of it, proud of his, where his family background, proud of his Jewish religion. Okay. And he was, he was really, he really confirmed himself by it. He confirmed himself by his Jewishness, by his Hebrew of the Hebrew connection. All right. He even sat at the feet of Gamaliel. And this was the most illustrious rabbi of his day. I mean, it's, it's like saying, I went to Yale. I went to Harvard. I went to Princeton. He went to a certain, he was, he was in the elite group and, and, and he was really well grounded in Jewish orthodoxy. He was well taught. He was steep in it. He stood on it. He made his decisions by it. He walked by it. He ordered his life by it. And the last thing I'd like to mention, he, he conformed to the law. He conformed to the law. He was an excellent student of the law. He was, he was, he was a A student or the A plus student of his class. And he did it with enthusiasm. He was steep in his ancestral tradition. He had a zeal, a passion, something that Christians don't have. That we, you know, Christians look so um, um, kind of, excuse the word, poopy. You know, they, 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 they even come to church looking like, you know, it's just a chore. But this, this, this man, Paul and Saul at that time was excited. He was, he was, he was passionate about his Jewish teaching about the law. And so he saw the church, the Christian church has an enemy that it should be stamped out and it's trying to compete with so great a religion 
as a Jewish religion. And so he says to himself, when he met Jesus on the Damascus road, he had to come against all that. Did you hear what I said? All that. His birth, his culture, his religion, and his education. Oh my, 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 my. Please don't touch that. Because when I get in the midst of people, even in a social setting, that's what I project. That's how I present myself. Where I was born, my culture, my education, and maybe my religion. These are the kinds of things that we hold up as our calling cards, so to speak. And Saul or Paul was no different. You understand? He was gratified. He was affirmed by these things. These things he used to define him. These things he used to make sure that people recognize him by all of that. When you see me, see this. When you have a relationship with me, this is what you have the relationship with. Where I was born, my culture, my education, my religious belief. That's what makes me Paul. <laughs> Jesus have mercy. Come against that now. Come against that. Touch any area of that, and we're going to be in trouble. Don't humiliate me. Don't discredit me. Recognize those things. Keep those things when you see me before you. When you shake hands with me, shake hands with that. And Paul said, I counted. Oh, Lord. Now, you see, if he didn't know how to count, he would be in trouble this morning. And I'm wondering how come we don't know how to count as a Christians? We mean we have to go back up the stairs. One, two. What happened to our counting ability? He said, those, those, I, those what those I counted as laws. What those, what I just mentioned. And I just, I just mentioned a few. All right. And the word counted here means to esteem, to judge. All right. To deem, to consider. It's an accounting term. Some of you just finished that, you know, doing your income tax or you're still trying to do your income tax. And it's all based on counting. What you got in and what you gave out. What you're worth, what you're worth, what you think you're worth, okay? But all of it is done to give you a value. This is what you should value. This is what you are worth. And Paul said, all of those things that I thought was all that, now, we, 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 we're not saying that, you know, where you were born is not important and that God does not recognize that. Let me just say that right now as a disclaimer, because sometimes when we preach like this, people try to put it in another way. So let me just, just lay it out right there. God does recognize our birth. He's the one that created diversity. He's the one that put one person in Africa, another person in Australia. He also recognizes family. You had to have somebody to bring you here. And he's a God of families. He's a God of the whole human race. We are created in his image. So he's not discounting that. He's not even discounting the fact that you are, you know, you, you come from a, a certain culture and language or your education or your accomplishment because all good gifts come 
comes from above. You see what I'm saying? You, you, you got through school, whether you're a believer or not, because God reigns over the just and the unjust. You see what I'm saying? You're able to do all of that because he gave you the ability to do it and the ability to accomplish it and your employment, you know, whether you're, 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 you're employed by someone, you're self-employed or you're employed in many ways. Like, you know, one person can have five jobs now just by sitting at their desk. So all of that, you can, you can affirm yourself by that, who, 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 who you're connected with, who you're working with, that people want you for what you have to offer. God does not discount all of that. Neither does Paul. What he's saying is those things didn't save my soul. You see, that's what it is right there. All of that, I was still disconnected from my creator. I was still an offense to his holiness. I was still separated from having a relationship with him. I was still alienated, alienated from God, alienated from the commonwealth of grace. I was still not part of his family. I was still not part of the family of God, intimately, intimately involved in a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, because none of those things are Jesus Christ. None of those things. None of those things represent Jesus. None of those things compare to Jesus Christ. So I, I might have held it up, you know, to be a candidate for the Sanhedrin. I might have been the boy in the school sitting at the feet of Gamaliel. I'd have been all of that to other people, but in the eyes of God, I was an enemy. <laughs> other people are impressed, other people. But in the eyes of God, his, his face was turned away from me because he can't look at sin. Can't. Somebody said, well, that doesn't mean anything to me, but to the Christian, it should mean something to you. And so, when Paul had his connect, con contact with Jesus on the Damascus road, he now started counting differently. He now started looking at values differently. He was estimating, considering, looking at his life differently. You see, and that's what happened to a Christian, a Christian who encounters the grace of God immediately you start looking at your life differently. And the sanctification process is that you continue to count. See, you, you don't just count one day. You're counting until Jesus comes again. You see, now he was counting and he's saying all of those things were an improper estimate of my character. Because you can have all of that and your character is twisted, all right? Those things hindered me from having a relationship with the Lord. So I counted as loss, and the word loss there means damaged. You know, damaged, it's, it's worthless, useless, non-functional. Oh God, oh God, oh God. I know, listen, the ego can't stand this language this morning. You know, I, 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 I'm not, I wish I could come and say, no, I don't wish. But I know you would, some people would proper, probably prefer me to say, hold on. Your ship coming in. Now, here's a real ship right here. The real ship right here is cut your losses. You're holding those things too dear on the same level as the cross of Calvary. And how do you know that? Touch it. Touch it. Let somebody challenge it. And you'll see the anger and the passion, the zeal and the enthusiasm that will come out of your spirit and your mouth that does not sound the same when you talk about the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. But, but Paul, you know, he saw, you know so Paul wasn't struggling. He said, I counted but, dog, but loss. And then he goes on to even say further, it gets even more descriptive. I counted as dung, dung. And dung means what you throw to the dogs. 
It means the vilest dross or the worst excrement. It means it's utterly insignificant. It should not be esteemed because it did not bring me closer to God. It, it, it kept me moving away all the way from the Lord. How do we know that? Look what he did to the church. All of those things gave him the energy. It drove him, his ambition, his desire to excel in the, in, 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 in the, in the, in the structure of the, uh, of the Sanhedrin, his, his desire to be the prince of that community, his desire to excel to the top did not drive him towards God. It drove him to come after the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible said he made havoc of the church. He attacked women and children. He held the garments of Stephen, the first martyr, while he was being martyred. He, and he didn't see anything wrong with it. You see, when you're driven by those things, you don't see anything wrong with what you're doing. You think you're fine. I think I'm fine because all those things are the things that I use to value me, my time, my money, my relationship, my future, my decision. Paul said, I can't flirt with that. I got to put it in its place because that's what kept me from God. So I counted but dumb. And he says, I, am, I made a judgment. I renounce it. I did not depend on it anymore. I denounce it so I could now rely on God for my salvation. And it was not only about his salvation, but his walk with God. Anything that he saw that would devalue his relationship with the Lord, that would compete with his relationship with the Lord that would distract him from his relationship with the Lord that would take on more value in his eyes than his relationship with the Lord. It was a continual thing. It's in the imperfect. I continue to count it as dung. Why so extreme? Come on. You don't have to be that, 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 uh, um, 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 so, so succinct, you don't, you don't have to be that graphic. That's the word I'm looking for and call it dung. Give it a nicer word because we're all into nicer words. You can't use a real definition for anything anymore. You can't call things sin. You just have to call it struggle. See? You, you, you can't tell somebody that they're doing wrong. You just say, well, they just slipped a little. No, no. Paul said dung. You see? Because in order for him to keep coming up with the right estimate, the right accounting, he could not keep putting anything in that column. He had to erase it and denounce it. He couldn't keep saying, well, you know, it was bad, but it was not so bad. That's what we say when we're holding on to things. Oh, you know, there's nothing really wrong with it. What's wrong with it? You know? And that's why the Bible said to lay aside every weight and every sin. Because you see, sin is clearly defined, but weight gets a little gray area. And weight means anything that holds you down from running consistently, running with agility, running, running continually. You understand? Not dropping out of the race. God, not dropping out of the race and going the sideline. No, no, no. But keeping up. Even if the pace gets a little slower or it might get a little faster or you might have to walk instead of run, but you're still in the race. He said, I esteem the cross more important than whose feet I sat at in my educational process. Oh, listen, we still do that stuff. We still do it. If we don't mention where we have been and what we have accomplished, we feel like we are nothing. Take that away from us, and we went. We go into a. If it's not op an open rage, you can hear the biting, and you can hear the and you can hear the resume coming out, coming out, coming out in defense of who we are. I am what I am, by what? Lord have mercy by the grace. I, I listen. Paul 
He sat down and did his, his calculations right. Wealth and honor and all of that did not define him anymore. It, it's not that you don't mention your past and you, you don't put it in his right perspective. Paul is saying, listen, I don't play with that because those things kept me from having God the way I should. And now the second point is, and I'm, I'm, I'm finished. He counted something was lost, but what did he gain? Because that's what we were afraid of. We were afraid of counting those things lost because we feel like we're not gaining nothing. You understand? So I gave this up and I'm not supposed to brag about that, but what should I brag about now? Because look what I've become. <laughs> oh, hey, help me Holy Ghost right here. Look what I have been reduced to. And trust me, Christians think that if God ever shifts them drastically or shifts you drastically from one thing to the other to set you up, to turn the world up, right side up, you'll be surprised to know the agony of defeat and the failure of victory. Because we don't think he has brought us to something. We think he has defrocked us. <laughs> Lord have mercy. And that's why there's no joy, you see. And that's why every now and then there's this, this, this gruntleness and frustration. And you can hear the mumbling and the glumbling and the whatever and the biting. And if something, something comes up that's not going the way you want it, you want to you come out fighting. Because you see, you don't, think you're, you don't think you're anywhere now. Look at me. You don't, you, when you meet other people, you ain't want to see them because you don't have nothing to brag about. So, 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 so Paul is saying, I gained something. Listen to me. I gained something. I gained something. And what I gained cannot be compared. There's no comparison. That's why, that's why he didn't keep holding it up. He said, I, I have a reason to boast. I have a reason to boast. I came from a, a good stock. I went to a good school. I had the greatest professor. I was on my way to the Sanhedrin court. If I want to brag, hey, I can brag. Mm -mm 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 -mm. If I want to brag, I can brag. I can brag. I can brag. I can brag. But he doesn't brag. He's, he's making a bold statement. And he didn't have to keep saying it because when he keeps saying it, it means you're not convinced. He said it and he moved on. He said, listen, what did I gain? Remember, this is accounting now. What did I gain? What did I lose? For the excellency of the knowledge. And you know, we like knowledge. God knows we like knowledge. Yes. You keep information from people and they'll almost kill you. If they think you're hiding something from them and not giving them all the information, they, they rise up at you. And sometimes you don't even have all the information yourself. But anyway, they feel like the more knowledge they have, the more they're in control. You see, because knowledge, we say knowledge is power. Knowledge is power. So the more information we have, you see, and that's why we're frustrated with God. Because he gives us a little bit of something and don't give us the whole picture. So we're angry. We're angry. We're upset. We're upset. We're upset. Because we want all the knowledge. Why do you want all the knowledge? So I can know what to do. You hear the word to do? <laughs> that means that he ain't doing nothing. We're going to do the to-doing. We don't need him to the do. Just give me the information, God. Give me the information and how to do this. God said, oh, really? The information I'm giving you is for you to sit down and let me do it. Oh. 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 You're, you're trying to make it seem like I don't have enough sense. No, you don't, you don't have it. You don't have it. But I have gained. Paul, you're not coming out a loser. You can't be a loser. You wrote one third of the New Testament. <laughs> Whew. You can't be a loser. You built the churches in Asia Minor and allowed the gospel to get to, to, to Europe so we could have it in the United States. You can't be a loser. But you see, Paul wasn't concentrating on that. He wasn't, because we, we have to have before us, oh, 
when, 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 when I'm, I'm going to be able to do so and so and so and so. Paul didn't have that. All he had was a statement. I count that so that I could have this. I lost that so I could gain this. I had to denounce that so I could gain this. What did you gain, Paul? The excellency, and the word excellency there is a superiority. It is surpassing what I thought I knew. It is over and beyond what I thought I knew. I thought if I knew certain things that I would be there. But when I, when I met Jesus, there was a different kind of knowledge that's superior to any knowledge. Because remember, he's omniscient. He's all-knowing. Listen, oh my God. Listen to how we have cheated ourselves. We're hanging out with people that just have a little bit of knowledge. We're so impressed. You know, that's why we run behind them. Because we think that they've got some, some kind of special, special, special that they read in a book that somebody else wrote and then somebody else wrote and then somebody else wrote the subject on that. So we run after people that are, we think, we think, we think have certain ideologies and philosophies and thoughts that impress us and inflame us and that we project ourselves into it. Paul said, listen, when I met Jesus, I found a superior kind of knowledge. It's better. And I count everything that I, I, I used to do completely valueless because of what it is more valuable. You understand? It's worth more. What Jesus tells me, shows me, informs me, instructs me, corrects me is worth more than what I had before. What I had before only inflamed me and underwrote my bad character. <laughs> oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. So the first thing is, it showed me the excellency. The next thing, what, what kind of knowledge did you gain? The knowledge of Jesus Christ, spiritual truth spiritual truth and it's amazing that the world is looking for spiritual experiences every time you turn around somebody's teaching you how to meditate how to devote they're giving you how to coin a certain phrase so you could feel better about yourself they're telling you what's toxic and what how to avoid toxic relationship they're telling you how to to, to touch your inner spirit come on one one young man has gone to india to try to find himself after he got in 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 a public situation a public disgrace and 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 was out of control now he's gone to another country to find some kind of spiritual uh, release or spiritual answer. And, 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 and Paul is saying, when, 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 when I counted all of that, you see, we can't try to find something new if we didn't see anything wrong with the old. You see, that's where it's not going to work. You know why it's not working? Because we still don't see nothing wrong with the old. Paul said, all of that, all of it is a law. We don't like to hear all. That's too conclusive. Come on. That, that, that's too much. Come on, come on. That's asking too much now. But in order for me to gain, help my soul today. God, you help me. In order for me to get it right and get it good. <laughs> uh, in order for me to gain spiritual truth, Ephesians 3.19 and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's the love of Christ towards us. The immensity of his redeeming love. It is this love which is shown that no one else can give, and you can't find it anywhere else but in Jesus Christ. To know this, to feel it, to have it, to walk in it, is the highest privilege to open up my eyes. I didn't have this knowledge before. I knew nothing about love. God have mercy. I knew nothing about the love of Christ. I knew nothing about this different kind of love. Behold what different kind of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. 
Lord have mercy. You don't know you, with all of your culture and your education and your experience, you don't know this kind of spiritual truth unless you have Jesus. Unless you denounce that, denounce. You see, that's the problem. We want to take the world's concept of love and put it in our marriage. Marriages, that's why it doesn't work. The way the world tells you to love and you bring that into your marriage, that's why the marriage isn't working. But to know the love of Jesus is a different kind of love. You see, nothing should excite you when you discover that love, that, that this love that reached all the way down and picked up a man like Moses who was a murderer and turned him into a deliverer. Lord have mercy that picked up a woman like Rahab who was a harlot and turned her into a woman that had a covenant relationship with God. Lord have mercy, the love of God that forgave David who committed murder and stole a man's wife, but gave him a second chance. Listen, you can't find that anywhere else. No, you can't. No, you can't. It takes getting to know. That's the kind of knowledge that Paul gained in comparison to the, the knowledge that he had. Oh, one is like excrement, but here is a more excellent way of living life. My God, when you get to know him and know that he loves you, for God so loved, for God so loved, for God very much loved, for God exceedingly loved, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Second Corinthians 5, 14, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead and that he died for all, and that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. This love teaches you not to live unto yourself, but to live unto him. All the other stuff that he learned, all his past was for him. It was for him, and that's why we like it. It makes us look good. It makes us feel good, and that thing, that desire to make us the us, the us, the, the us, and the only us, the me and the only me is the thing that's killing the church because we will not count those things but dung. We still are tantalized by the world's definition. And Paul said, I refuse it. I let it go. I cross it off the list. I count it but dung so that I could know what love is. And love teaches us to forgive, to have compassion. Love teaches us that it's not what we feel, it's what we know. In him we live, in him we move, and in him we have our being. But we still want the world to tell us it's a physical thing. It, 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 it's flattery, it's seduction, it's lust. And we still go after it full force because we don't want to count it dung. Lust is dung. Flattery is dung. But the love of Jesus is the excellent way of living. And we count all of that but tongue to latch on to the love of Christ. The next thing he did, he not only learned and got spiritual truths about who Jesus is and about the love of Jesus, but about God's knowledge, his grace. You see, it's not just intellectual, it's, it's experiential. He had a relationship with God personally. What did I gain? My Lord. <laughs> not the family, not the family Lord, not your Lord, but my Lord. He gained a personal relationship with the Lord. Not that it's not based on truth, but this communion with God involves one's thoughts, but it also involves my heart. See, all of his other experience had to do with his intellectual acumen, his ability to grab information and to conceptualize information and to distribute information and to manipulate information and to influence others with information. But the heart wasn't there. How do you know the heart wasn't there? How are you going to hold a man's clothes and see people stoning him and, 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 and don't feel some kind of justice or feel compassionate? How are you going to go after women and children out of your intellectual zeal? 
for your religion. No, 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 no. Oh, but when he met Christ, something happened to his heart. And what he's saying, this is what I gained. I gained to know Jesus as my Lord. If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God had raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the mouth, confession is made. With the heart, man, believe it unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It's a heart thing. It's a heart thing. And Paul suddenly discovered his heart. Lord, I gave up what I thought was important, but I found out that I had a heart and that Jesus can live inside of this heart. And this intimate relationship brought me joy. It's not just merely knowing about God. It's not knowing about him. He was studying the law. He was knowing about God. He knew the Pentateuch. He probably could run the Pentateuch around us a hundred times. He knew the law, not only the Ten Commandments, all the 613 laws. This boy was a student par excellence. He knew about, but he didn't have a relationship with. I count all of that about for the with. I don't want the about. I thank God for the with. Okay? I've thrown everything away. I suffered the loss of all things. And it is in, it is, it, when he said he suffered the loss, is in the error's tense, meaning he did it once and for all. He denounced it when he was converted. Okay? And he not only denounced all of that, it was not forced on him. Nobody told him, denounce this. Denounce this. No. He did it himself because when he tasted love, when his spirit man became alive, when he realized who loved him and who cared for him, when he saw himself in the eyes of God, and now God has brought him into an intimate relationship, he willingly denounced it, okay? He forfeited all of that. Opportunity was his. Let me just say this. He was an opportunist. Give me a letter and let me go down. That's where he was on his way to Damascus. He saw that he was going to be elevated and promoted. He was striving for elevation and promotion at the expense of his soul. <laughs> hey, but God had a plan. Well, let me finish this, please. All right, all right, all right, all right. Why did he do all of this? What was the motivating factor? Why? And my conclusion, let's, let's do the math. Why are you coming up with this calculation after you counted? You counted what you lost. Now you're looking what you gain. Why are you coming to this? Did you count right? <laughs> You know, I, I remember I was working with one of the, just recently, just recently, one, one of the little kids, you know, I have a couple of saving, you know, um, boxes or saving things, you know, one looked like a shoe, one looks like a pig, and they all would come and drop their monies in it. And, and one of one of them who is very, you know, careful, uh, she remembers everything, you know, they, they call her Barbara Walters, because she remembers everything and reports everything. So she says, I, I want to count what's in there, you know, because everybody, all of them put it in there. So we're counting it so we could dish it out so they could put it in their bank account. So she came and, and, and she was adding up and adding up. And I just made a mistake and, you know, didn't add right. She's, on, she's only, I think she's nine, eight, nine, you know. And she said to me, I'm sorry, but that's wrong. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, TT, but that's wrong. You didn't carry the one over. <laughs> I said, well, blow me down. This child's teaching me math. And that's probably what's wrong with many of us. We forgot how to calculate correctly. And Paul said, I didn't calculate it. I didn't calculate correctly. I counted my loss. Now this is what I gained. Why? Let's do the math. I've thrown away everything. All right? I renounced everything. And as I said, it was voluntary. It was not forced. Why? In order to serve him. 
See, that that's that's why many of us struggle. That's why many of us struggle to 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 walk steadily with the Lord. That's why many of us are fickle. We're in this, in that. We can't stay in this. We can't, we can't finish. We can't go through. We give up easily every every other minute. We you know why? Because we're still holding on to something and we don't see it as a loss. We still think if we had that, we would be all that. Paul said, I don't want that so I could be all this. What is the this? To serve God and not serve myself. Anything that you don't count as a loss is a service unto you. That's why you don't want to give it up. It serves you too well. It touches a certain part of you that you don't want to let go. It makes you feel a certain way that you feel if you give it up, you won't have anything to replace it. If you lose that, then what am I getting? Jesus. See, we don't think... We can't, we can't imagine that because whatever it is that we won't count as a loss means too much. But you can't, you can't, you can't hold on to this, this thing over here that you feel is, it's winning for you and be over here and think that this is going to work for you. You understand? That's why Paul created the illustration. Forgetting those things which are behind. See? He has to keep doing that because if he keeps doing this, he can't do this. See that? I can't live like this. Who walks like this? Can you sleep like this? Can you eat like this? Can you function like this? It's hurting my arm right now. You understand? But when I do this, I'm free. And many of us, something back there, something different. Let's just be honest with yourself. Something back there that, and that's why you're always in pain. There's no joy. There's no peace. You know, because I'm not feeling joyful right now. I'm in pain. I'm miserable. Let somebody say something to me and see if I don't pop off. Because I'm, I'm, what? But when I do this, oh, look at the ease. Look at the. So either do this, either live, either live like that with your arm backwards. Stay up in it or do this. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching for those things which are ahead, I press towards the mark of the prize of a higher calling in Christ Jesus. So why is he counting? Why is he making this kind of calculation? I have abandoned everything that I am familiar with. I'm familiar with. And I've come to this conclusion. Either he uses the word count or reckon or consider. It means in light of my evaluation, I see those things as mere garbage. They messed me up. They tainted me and tarnished me. They didn't bring healing and deliverance and light okay i consider it my garbage and i just i count it fit for the refuge heap in other words i'm not even keeping it near me i'm putting it way where it belongs i'm throwing it in the street that's another phrase that could be used and my motive for doing it is because i've done a re-evaluation and i want to gain christ i want to gain him now gaining christ here you know, means to win. Another part of the, the text means to win. You can see it in that chapter. And winning might mean that I can win Christ, you know, like you, you win a trophy, you know, or you win, you know, you win a prize, whatever. No, that's not what it, it, it doesn't mean. Jesus is not in the game for you to win. What, what is, it says, so I might gain the advantage to have a relationship with him. So I might value the fact that I belong to him. You see, it's not, about, it's not about winning Christ. It's getting the opportunity, the advantage to be close to him. That's where the gain is. I have an opportunity 
to get close to him, to win, to, 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 to be in his, in his favor, to walk in his light, to drink his water, to eat his bread, to grow in grace. So by losing all that, the world calls excellent. Oh, she's excellent. Oh, I mean, she's just, oh, he's just, and could be in that field. It could be, but not when it comes to your eternal security. So what he's saying is all of that that you get excited about, don't be upset if I'm not flattered. So says, yes, Amazata. Shepherd of the Oh, God, you helped me right here. Don't get upset because I'm not jumping up and down like you think I should jump up and down. Because there's a greater value that I have. I value my life in a different way. Now, thank you for the flowers and thank you for, but when you go home and I close the door three o'clock in the morning, I can't ride on that. Because the same one that gives you the flowers takes it. What I ride on is that in him I live <laughs> and in him I move. And in him, I have my being. I know you all think that's black, but I tell you, I can't say it no other way. I can only express it the way it's down in my soul. Now, you can speak in a very monotone, but I got to speak in a little something to let you know how much this means to me. And I'm not going to quench it down and quiet it down because it makes you uncomfortable and you think I'm bringing my culture. No, I'm bringing my soul up in this. Hey, glory to God. All the love of Jesus that snatched me from the jaws of hell. Oh, the love of Jesus that grabbed me when I thought I was going somewhere, being something, and he took me and changed my mind and let me see what real value is, what real worth, what real love is. He took me who, were, who, who, who is not valuable. What valuable thing did I bring to Jesus? What is it that I can give to Jesus that he didn't have himself? <laughs> Oh, 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 You bring certain values to your community because they don't have it. You're a good accountant, so they need you. You're a good teacher, so they need you. But what can you teach Jesus? Who taught him? Look at me. Let me, let me, let me say something. When you begin to see yourself in that perspective, suddenly, if you get it, it doesn't matter. If, you, if you're not successful in a certain area, it ain't no big deal. If somebody doesn't recognize you for what you think you're doing, it's okay. Because there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God, a place where sin cannot molest, <laughs> near to the heart of God. And, and when things are not going well, when, 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 when all that you worked for seem like it's not working for you, when, when, when it seemed like you're not getting what you're supposed to get, and when all of that seemed like it's not successful in the eyes of man, but in your secret closet, you know it's well with your soul. <laughs> oh, Jesus, have mercy. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. Count your losses this morning. You're still kissing them. You're still holding them. You're still using them as a means to define you. You're using it to make your way in the world. You're too, you're too skillful. You're too smart. You're too glib. You're too quick. And at the end of the day, your soul and your character being compromised. There's no joy. Your, the parts of your life is still locked up in a dark world. But when you count all your losses and you go all the way for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Lord have mercy. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. That's the kind of testimony, not just for Paul. It's, oh, that's just for Paul. That's just for people, you know, who, who claim to have a certain anointing. No, it's for every saint. Whether you think you have an anointing or you can't preach, you can't teach, you can't do nothing, you're still, God is still wanting that place. Because when we begin to hold on to the things that we think determine us, like fashion. If we don't have on a Nike, Nike, if we don't have on something like, you know, 
we 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 walk we walk a certain way. Now we we ain't got no money to pay the rent, but we, we you know we 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 look a certain way. And believe me, there are people who swear by it like a religion. They swear by that they have to wear certain things in order to be received. They it, it's it's almost like an obsession. It's almost like an obsession that we have to be identified that way for our worth. It's not something you have to wear for your, 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 your vocation or your profession. That's a different story. But we wear it as a badge. Too many badges, ladies and gentlemen. We have too many decorations and none of them touch the soul. I said none of them. None of them wipe away the tears. None of them grab the heart when it sinks down and feel like it's about to be broken in a thousand pieces. None of them can give us guidance when we're walking through a dark place. None of them. None of them. None of them work. None of them work. And we're too, we're too wrapped up in some of them to let it go wrong, wrong relationship, wrong. Wrapped up and tied up because it affirms you in a certain area, the touch, the smell, the thought, the affirmation, the words. Can't give this up right now. Shedama, hobia, soap. Can't give it up right now. It keeps me from falling apart. It keeps me from going crazy. It keeps me from making, make, making me remember my rejection. So I can't let it go. And the Lord said, but you're losing. Hey, you're losing. I got something better. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Lord have mercy. Because you're more than a conqueror through him, through him that loves you. Ladies and gentlemen, cut your losses this morning. Because if you don't cut your losses, write in the column next to it, life of misery, life of misery. When there is joy unspeakable, full of glory. And Paul continued to live a life, not a life without pain or a life without, without struggle, but he continually say that for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. That's not just for preachers to preach, it's for us to live. And your misery is not because Jesus didn't give you what you want, it's because you didn't let go of what you think you need. And now you gain it. When you, I dare you to let it go. I dare you to let it go. I dare you to let it go. I dare, I dare you to let her go. I dare you to let him go. I dare you, I dare you to close the book, seal it, throw it away, and say, uh uh uh, this is it for me today. This is it for me today. I want him more than I want my chiefest bread. Take that step of faith, go all the way and see the glory of the Lord. You want too much for you. Oh, they, they put my name on there, but they didn't put the title, or you know, they, they had a meeting and they didn't recognize me. That's why you're miserable. You see, that's why you're miserable. What is it? What, what, what is recognition when you were even healed? What it, can recognition heal you? Can recognition give you peace of mind? So you get all the recognition, but you're almost on life support. Cut your losses and reach out for your gain. Who are you gaining? And this is not just be arrogant now, don't be, because some of you, you got to cut your, your arrogant losses. Well, they didn't recognize me, but I'm cutting my losses. You ain't delivered because you still want to be recognized. There's supposed to be a humility. There's supposed to be a humility in there. Don't be using this message for your foolishness. Don't be using it with your sarcastic tongue. Stay humble. Cut your losses, all the things that I use to define me, and go after what really matters. Count and see the value. When you walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on your way. 
when you do his good will, and abides with you still, you just have to trust and obey. You, you don't have to, you don't, you don't have to toot your own trust and obey. For there is no other, listen what the song said, for there is no other way to be what? Happy. You want happiness when you're still holding on to stuff. No other way to be happy in holding on to your point. They, they, I'm going to hold on to my point even if they don't agree with me. There's no other, you got too many points. There's no other way to be happy in who? Not in yourself, but in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Lord, we thank you for this word. Help me to cut my losses. And thank you for what I've gained. I've gained you. I've gained your friendship, your fellowship. I've gained your guidance and your counsel. I've gained your protection. I've gained your promises. Oh my God. I've gained eternal life. I've gained comfort. My God, when my heart was broken, I gained comfort. For you said that, that blessed are they that mourn, for you shall comfort them. What I gained, comfort cannot be bought. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for when I, when I slipped and fell, you picked me up again. Lord, that's what I gained. That's what I gained. What I had before would never have done that. Thank you for it. Thank you. Thank you for giving us this insight. And thank you, thank you that we're learning how to count. In Jesus' name, amen. You're out there and you don't know Jesus? This is the way you start. This is your first day that you're going to start counting differently, looking at your life differently, valuing who you are inside of God differently. Just repeat after me, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus, you said in your word, you said in your word, that if I confess with my mouth, that if I confess with my mouth, the Lord Jesus, the Lord Jesus, and believe in my heart, and believe in my heart, that God raised Jesus, that God raised Jesus from the dead, from the dead, I shall be saved. I shall be saved right now, right now. I confess you as my Lord. I confess you as my Lord. I denounce anything. I denounce anything. That will keep me away from you. That will keep me away from you. And thank you for accepting me. Thank you for accepting me. Loving me. Loving me. And wanting me. And wanting me. I surrender to you. I surrender to you. You are my Lord. You are my Lord. Lord, whoever prayed this prayer far and near, I'm asking you, God, to minister to them in a way that they've never experienced you before. Lord, give them truth, give them understanding, and give them guidance so they can continue to cut their losses so they could gain more of you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you don't have any way to go to, to get more information about the decision you made today. Go to BethRafa.org and touch Barnabas Ministry and you will find the information you need and the help that you need so you could continue to gain more of God's love, more of God's truth so that your faith can rise and your joy can be settled in your soul. Go with this in mind. In Jesus' name. And for those of you who are Christians out there, I want you to raise your hand today because many of you are holding on. Many of you are going through difficulties. You know why? You're holding on to things that's not working. And you just believe that if you let it go, you'll just, you'll, your life will never be anything. Who will ever see me? Who will ever know me? Who will ever? Jesus, come on, let it go. It will, some things, Many things will never, ever come back. This world is changing so fast that things will not be the same. Today, something and tomorrow, it's gone. You need to know that there is a permanent, intimate, ongoing relationship with God that will sustain any changes, any cultural changes, any political changes. 
It will hold your mind. It will hold your mind. Your belief will hold your mind in an unchanging Jesus that gives you a permanent relationship. So don't hold on to anything. Painful to let it go. Afraid to let it go. But take that step of faith right now. In the name of the Lord Jesus, I want to let go of what I've been fighting for. I'm fighting for something that I didn't need to fight for. I was holding on to it because I felt if I didn't get it, I didn't get it before. I didn't get it from my parents. So I must get it from somewhere, but I still didn't get it. So it must be that you have something else there for me. Help me, God. Today, help me. Today, help me. Don't let me live another day living in this uncomfortable position. Help me to let go so I can receive what you have prepared for me because you're my Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. We'll be back here at 1115. Come and join us again and come and worship with us. And remember, this is the Lord's day. God bless you. Back where you belong After the enemy told you You could never come back home My name is Esther And I am restored My name is Chloe And I am a restored woman My name is Mary I am a restored woman Hi. I'm Elizabeth And I am restored My name is Naomi and I've been restored. My name is Ruth, and I am a restored woman.